I'll call us to order for the Arvada City Council October 10th, 2022 workshops. And uh, Kristen Rush, if you'll do a roll call. Mayor Williams. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Jones. Here. Council Member Piper. Here. Council Member Marriott. Here. Council Member Mormon. Council Member Simpson. Here. Council Member Smith. Here. Entertain a motion, Mr. Piper. I'd like to move to excuse uh, Council Member uh, Mormon from tonight's workshop. All votes are cast. Mr. Jones, how do you vote on that? Yes. The rest of us have voted yes as well, so that passes six to zero. Mr. Mormon is excused tonight. City Manager Lori Gillis. Good evening, Council. We will start tonight with a 2023 pay plan update, it followed by a Colorado family update, both presented by Gabriella Bomber, Director of Human Resources. Thank you, Lori. Ms. Bomber. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Good to see you tonight. Um, thank you for your time this evening. I plan to share some information about um, the recommendations we're making for the 2023 pay plan. And then I'll follow that with our Colorado family recommendations. So I will start with the pay plan. I can't move this. Okay. So I'll start by sharing that um, the recommendations we made for or are making for the Colorado pay plan, sorry, the, <laughs> the city's pay plan for 2023 are guided by our total compensation philosophy. This philosophy was developed in 2012, so it's about 10 years old, but it's still um, very true today that we want to be an employer of choice, an employer of choice. And to us, that means that we want um, high-performing employees to choose to work for Arvada and stay and build their careers for, in Arvada when they have other options available to them which is a very big thing right now. They have many options. And so we really are challenged with keeping this philosophy going during these uh, very, co very competitive employment conditions. Um, but we keep it alive by putting together packages that pre provide an overall really enticing reason to be here at the city. And you can see some of the elements of that package listed in your slides. Uh, competitive salaries would be the component that feeds our pay plan. And uh, the recommendations we're making for you today allow us to keep that pay plan competitive with our market. We also aim to be fiscally responsible and ensure that we're using the city's funds in a responsible way and uh, able to fund the recommendations we're making through the city's 10-year financial model. Uh, the next slide speaks to our strategic alignment. Um, our work is aligned to the organizational service and effectiveness guiding principle of being a top workplace that attracts and retains a highly engaged workforce. We also have a council strategic result we align to around an organizational performance excellence framework. And in HR, we have a performance measure specific to the pay plan that helps us ensure we're meeting our target of being market competitive and that is to have 95% of our jobs graded according to their market value. Now, since the market is continuously changing and we only update our pay plan once a year, if we don't have these recommendations, we end up falling behind on that target. So currently, if we don't make the recommended changes, we are sitting around 68% of our target. So in order to present you with the recommendations, we, my team and I, we go through an enormous amount of data. We collect uh, data on a lot of different market conditions. We look at what's happened in the past year, what's happening today and currently, and then what's projected to happen in the future. And we collect a great deal of information to come up with the recommended changes. And one of the things we look at is turnover. This will be no surprise to you that We've been talking about this for a while now. Uh, turnover at Arvada is unusually high right now. Um, if you look at the graph there in, your, in the slides, back in 2012 when we first um, developed the philosophy, 
we were um, looking at a turnover of about 5.7%, and we were enjoying single-digit turnover for quite some time. And then in the most recent years, that number has tricked up, and um, last year it tripled. As you can see, we were at about 17.7% turnover, and uh, that is the highest I've seen it in my 13 years with the city. I don't know if anyone has seen it higher than that, but that is pretty high. And um, the good news is this year we're actually doing better than we were last year at this time. We were around 14%, and so we're two percentage points lower right now, and we're hoping that is sustained and that we come in lower than we did last year, but it's still pretty high for us in terms of turnover. Do you have any sense of how that compares to surrounding communities? I do. It's my next slide. Um, so oh, here, yeah. we're not alone. Um, these are the cities that responded. They're, they're the cities who responded, but also track turnover year to date. So most cities only track at the end of the year, and then they produce an annual number. These cities track monthly, like we do. And you can see there that we're not alone. We're all experiencing double-digit turnover right now, so it is a shared condition. This is just cities, but um, private sector, depending on what industry you're looking at, is even higher. A quick question about this. Uh, did, did, just curious, Aurora is low on this chart? I mean, did they give you any kind of insight of why they're churned, the positives and the negatives, you know, what, what makes them lower than us? I mean, even Lakewood, I think, is lower. So Lakewood, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I don't have any specific insight, but I'm happy to ask them. They I'm just curious if it's, sorry, spider web. <laughs> <laughs> it could be how um, they measure turnover, too. For example, I know um, Westminster looks unusually high, and so does Commerce City, but I know with Westminster, they're tracking um, other positions, like their seasonals as well. And so that number may reflect that. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but do you know, Rachel, if those numbers reflect? Um, I think from Westminster, it does reflect that people will think of Aurora, Pike is so back and impressive them. It is kind of hard to get an apples to apples comparison. Everybody says it's slightly different, but I'd be happy to see well, that. And just like in the private sector, I'm curious if people are leaving one city to go to the other city, you know, kind of job hopping a little bit and I'm just we curious. do see some of that okay um, also this may be um, a situation ours is through August and some of them maybe are reporting through June because mm -hmm. um, they'll do it in quarters so not an exact answer but some insight into how these numbers can differ and not be a true true apples to apples comparison I have a quick question if I could yes council member Jones um, does this include the PD as well, or is that a separate number? This includes all positions for the city, yes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so on the flip side of turnover is attraction, how we attract applicants and, and workforce to come to work for Arvada, and um, we're equally challenged here right now in this market conditions. The question, if anyone has the answer, to this question, please tell me, where are all the workers? Because they are not applying for jobs right now, and it's a mystery, really. We uh, have some ideas, but we have no exact answers on why there are so many jobs and not enough people. But you can see there on the left, the chart shows you the average number of applicants per job posting for the city over the past three years, and it has dropped by 70% over um, 2020, so we used to get about 40 applicants per job posting on average, and now we're seeing 12, and we posted a job two weeks ago, and we only had one applicant, so we are having to repost jobs repeatedly to get um, a good share of the, can the candidate pool. Um, Arvada's unemployment is extremely low, um, that number, 2.8%, really tells us that um, everyone who wants to work has a job. And uh, we're just, we're seeing this um, condition continue month after month with no prediction as to when it will end. On the right, you can see it's actually a national problem. Um, that's just a headline we pulled while we were doing our research that there are 5 million more jobs than there are unemployed people. 
And so that just gives you an understanding of we're sharing this problem across the nation. Gabrielle, let me ask you two quick questions. <clears throat> so in your uh, profession, is there an ideal number of applicants you'd like to have for each opening? I mean, it strikes me as 40 might be more than you need. Um, five might be less than you need, but is there a number that's kind of ideal? It's really more about quality. If you get five really good candidates, that's wonderful. But if you get 30 not so awesome and you weed them out and you're left with two or three and then they don't show up for interviews, that, that's pretty lousy. So we used to get 100, 200 applicants when I first came to the city. Um, I would say somewhere in between, uh, somewhere around 100 is a real sweet spot because that allows us to really be selective and uh, choose the top so of the crowd. 100 applicants for every job opening is what you'd like to see? What I would like to see, yeah. okay. <laughs> yes. All right, so that's the first question. Second question is, obviously our unemployment rate is very low at 2.8%. Do you know what our workforce participation rate is in Arvada, particularly compared to the region or the country? I, I do not, but I'll look that up okay. for you. Thank you. Okay. What is workforce participation rate? It's, um, so unemployment rate is number of people who want to work, who are working versus labor participation rate takes in number of people who are working versus able to work. So, okay. so it'll include stay-at-home mothers, uh, people who right. might be home for some other reason, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Okay. One thing we have seen is the in un incoming workforce is really interested in non-traditional jobs. They're, they seek out um, flexibility and gig work, uh, influencer work. And so we're not capturing a lot of that workforce in these traditional jobs that we have. So that's part of our, how do we make government cool for that workforce is one of our goals. Right. And that, that'd be an example of somebody, the labor participation rate, you know, because somebody who drives for Uber is not listed as either employed or unemployed, nor are they listed as participating in, hmm. the, in the thing when it's, you know, individual gig stuff. All right, so now um, we also do a lot of studies around pay and how pay moves during the time that our pay plan was last um, updated. So we last updated it in January of this year. And the first thing we look at is how did pay change over the course of that year? Um, we have to predict what we, what we need to do for the following January to stay on top of the market. So one of the things we look at is the ECI, which is um, short for Employment Cost Index. This is uh, published by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It's a national number, and it, uh, they update it quarterly. So in January, we looked it up. It was 4.5%, which means the cost of labor overall in the nation increased by 4.5%. And then we looked at it again in June, and it had ticked up to 5.1%. Um, this is indicative of employers um, doing more adding more things in the middle of the year versus just the once a year movement, um, seeing that number tick up like that. For perspective, this number has averaged in my time here between two and a half and 3% in past years, so it, ha it has really bumped up quite a bit for this market conditions we're in. We also look at projected increases reported by our Employers Council, SHRM, which is the Society of Human Resources Management, and World at Work, which is the premier compensation association. And um, they projected in January that pay increases for next year would go around 4.1% as well. So um, following that trend, it's ticking up from the 3% number we're used to seeing. But again, this was reported in January before employers started to respond to the economic situation we're in. So Employers Council did another survey in June asking employers in the front range, what are you doing to respond to um, the current economic situation with your workers? And 41% of Colorado employers who responded to that survey said they were giving additional compensation increases in the form of a cost of living 
or a market um, or a performance. You can see there a list of some of the creative things um, organizations are doing. So we had a city survey of our peers that we decided to see if our cities are also responding in that way, and it did show that they are also doing similar things, similar to the things we're recommending. Um, range adjustments, market, cost of living across the board. They're even um, offering monthly stipends to help with gas, things like that. So we're uh, seeing that trend continue. And then our market analysis, that's a very in-depth study we do every year. It takes us a couple of months. We look at every single job that's matched the market. We uh, measure how it's moved in value over the course of the year. And our um, analysis this year came through very consistently for most job families at about 6% average, which kind of led to our recommendation. Now, I will point out that the executive family had a very assertive movement of uh, between 15 and 18%, depending on which position you're looking at. So we are making a recommendation to address that as well, which I'll talk about in a minute. Mr. Marriott. So quick question. So when you do the market analysis with each job compared to the private sector, are you comparing um, not only salaries and wages, but also benefits? So you compare total cost of that employee versus just the pay side? Yes, we do, com we do comparisons of both. Of both, okay. Yes. So can I go along those lines? I mean, um, so is our, our, our pay plans for the classifications of our employees, um, I'm trying to think of how to word it. Are we, when you look at total compensation, are, are we providing a, a pay or benefit that, you know, kind of, one of the issues that CDOT's dealing with is workforce housing mm -hmm. and getting people. And, and one of the things that we just did a market study here was uh, the cost of living in Denver all the way up to Glenwood Springs. Um, and so we're doing stipends and we're building houses. Has, has, and I'm not saying that's an answer, but is that, is that anywhere in this presentation about, it's not just always pay, it's just can I even afford to live in, in the front range? Can I mm -hmm. even live? Because I know we, I think last time, I don't know if it was in a workshop or what, but you briefly said, well, we should consider folks more broadly, not you know statewide as well as maybe even nationally, people working remote for the city, and is that something we should consider? So are all those tools looked at, and are, will we, are they later in your presentation? Or? So they're not in this presentation because this is specific to the pay plan, but it is something, it is a topic in our total rewards study and how housing is a component of total rewards and uh, remote work as well. And so those are areas that we're studying and researching in terms of what, um, what rewards the city wants to offer and what to prioritize. So we will be coming to you separately with that information. When we um, discuss the total rewards philosophy, we want to update it since it is 10 years old and uh, we'll be discussing all those components and how we want to prioritize those in terms of the, what we offer to our employees. So it won't be addressed tonight, but, um, but it will be in a future meeting. Have that holistic view because mm -hmm. yes, we're, if you're gonna discuss pay increases here, that's just one element because now that there's variables of what people are offering, I know one county is offering just plain out free housing to live mm -hmm. in the county. And not that that's what we're looking at, but I mean, I'd like to look at the total compensation because with a 12 plus percent, you know, um, uh, is that vacancy? I can't remember what that's. Uh, oh, the turnover. Uh, yeah, yes. and, and with, um, with retention and recruitment, mm -hmm. it should be in our total philosophy around how we, we maintain, retain and, and recruit new folks. Because the pay is gonna solve some, but it won't solve everything. I agree yeah, with you, okay. yes. Okay. All right, did I advance my slide? So this leads us, after reviewing some of the points of data we collected, um, leads us to the recommendation we came to you with, is to increase our ranges by an overall 6% to stay, um, to continue our position with the market and be an employer of choice. Uh, this would be across all families, um, except for the executive family, which we're proposing to restructure. And so just as a, 
you know, we did come to you in August, and with your support, we were able to give half of that increase um, to our employees in August. So we've given a 3% market increase. Um, and to remind you, earlier this year in February, we also came with a market argument that we needed to increase our police officers' pay ranges. And with your support, we also did that. We um, increased the maximum pay for our officers by uh, really the whole family by 2.4%. And we added a bachelor degree premium to give credit for that degree to our officers and our sergeants of a 1.5%. So those were the changes we made for the mid-year. And then in January, with your support and approval, we'll issue the other 3%, the other half of the 6% market increase. With the executive job family, what we've done is we've rebuilt that pay structure to more align with its market. And um, we will replace, we'll put all the department heads back into that pay structure at a location in the range that's equivalent to the 6% movement that the rest of the employees have experienced. So we'll just pl place them at the closest to that amount. And they'll just have a little bit more earning potential at that point because their ranges have moved a little bit more. We also have 59 reclassifications we're recommending. Some of these have been approved mid-year and some are in the end of the year process. They are listed for you in your packets. Um, reclassifications, we recommend them when jobs change significantly in job duties. This could be due to a reorganization, a rewriting of the job, could be a career model development. Um, it could be the market value has gone so differently that we have to reassign a grade. And so we do recommend those each year as well. Um, you'll see them listed. They do include, those 59 do include the department head restructure. So just so you know, they're part of that list. The other changes that go along with the pay plan update is um, our step increases. Step increases are um, the city's way of providing a merit um, system to our employees. Each year, based on their performance, they are uh, eligible to advance a step in their range if they haven't gotten to the top. And um, that is how we motivate and um, uh, reward performance. And we have 72% of our employees eligible for steps in 2023, and that's budgeted at 2.5%. And then, of course, um, we did add all those FTEs that have been added. Um, we have 42 in the city's budget. We have 49 in the pay plan. Seven of those are Ralston House positions. So, Gabrielle, with, with these changes and additions, do we, hopefully we get a lot closer to that 95% goal that we have. Do you, have you figured out what, where that gets us in terms of, of how we compare to surrounding communities? It's right at 95%. Okay, yeah. good. Okay, so what does this mean for the budget? Um, you've heard some of this information already from the city manager in previous presentations, but this breaks it down for you specific to these changes. Um, the market increases we're suggest recommending are with including those police officer Increases we made in mid-year, um, it's 6.33% overall increase to the payroll. And then a three-quarter percent for those reclassifications we discussed, and a two and a half percent for steps. <coughs> Excuse me. And then you can see there the cost of adding the 42 new positions. Now this is more than the city originally had in its model for market increases. We had two and a half percent to start uh, round January or February, we warned Brian that wasn't going to be enough, and <laughs> we started working. We were working towards four and a half, so surprise when we ended up with six. But um, we did do the work, and we um, looked to fund through the 10-year model these increases. We, good portion of them are being funded by uh, projected vacancy savings, as well as the savings from our health care renewal, which came in flat for the fourth year in a row. Mr. Marriott. Gabriella, I see the on this slide there's a, a figure in there for $2.2 .2 million for the 42 new FTEs. Do you have a, an, an overall number for the all these four different items in the pay plan? What's the 
total Im annual impact to her? Um, it is in your packet. The dollar numbers are in the packet, but I haven't, I didn't add them all up into one. Okay. So I'll get that to you in the next Friday memo. Okay. 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 So finally, um, our recommendations, we do ask and request that you approve the recommendations to help us stay as an employer of choice in this incredibly competitive market. Um, these recommendations are data-driven, market-aligned, and um, in conjunction with our philosophy and our strategic results. And overall, you know, most importantly, I think it sends a powerful message to our employees how much we value them and how committed we are to continuing to be a top workplace for them. If there's no questions, I'll move on. Mr. Marriott, I actually have, and is this the end of the pay plan discussion? Yes. Okay. And John, it's 8.3 million. 8.3, okay, thank you. Thank um, you, The, uh, um, just a question, I wanna make a qu question and then a comment. So one of the questions I would have with the pay plan and wanna throw this out there, I realize this wasn't part of this pay plan, but have we looked at um, any kind of a pay differential for workers who work in person versus those who work remotely. As I think, you know, if you're doing the same job, I'd much rather do it at home too, probably. <laughs> um, but there, there may be some adjustability there of, of that. Have we talked about that or is that something that might be subject to future discussions? It certainly can be part of our discussions for sure. There are, um, so the answer is we haven't talked about it yet, but it's something we can have in our total rewards discussion as far as how to prioritize. Um, there are things we do today that um, provide more um, incentives for field type workers who come, those who come to work and have to come to work physically. Um, we have things like on-call pay, assignment pay, um, we have facility leave pay. These are all things that um, those of us who have the, you know, we can stay at home, we don't get these things. So they, there's already a few things baked in that help um, address that, but certainly we can look further into those differentials. Is it within the human resources kind of industry or business, are you starting to see anything like that? Is there any guidance or kind of models already out there? The discussions I've seen have been more related to nationwide remote work. So do you, do you offer a differential based on where they're living or where they're working? Those types of conversations have already started and are being discussed. Um, not so much within the same location. Um, uh, I haven't seen that yet, but okay. Okay. we might be the first we could start that conversation. Th thank you. So yeah. I just want to make a comment on, on the pay plan and this, um, this plan. You know, obviously we had discussions about it mid-year because that's when we um, approved a pay increase mid-year um, and then the other half to come here at the end of the year. Um, and uh, I, I think it's the right thing to do given the market and, and, and where we're at. I think we have to do that. The one thing that really catches my attention, however, on this pay plan is the 42 new FTEs. You know, in my time here on the city council, a lot of years we might have one or two or three or maybe five, 42 is more than 5% of our total employees increasing in one single year. And I think, you know, in the work we've done up to now, I believe all of them have been justified. I don't think there's anything here that's not justified, but I, it, it catches my attention that there's that much growth all in one year, because I don't believe we're growing any of the other things we do at that rate. Um, and it kind of reinforces how important management is to, to effectively utilize all those 42 new FTEs. You know, if they all are needed and they're all used effectively, it's a real positive thing. But if, if it creates a, a less manageable situation and, and you don't get full effect out of all those, two, all those new 42 FTEs in one go-round, um, I, I think it's not a positive thing. So I just... You know, just that's what catches my attention. I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you, Council Member Marriott. Mr. Fiverr. Uh, yeah, do we do anything for like essential workers? I mean, I'm, you know, other than, maybe other than PD, um, you know, our public works maintenance teams, our utility teams, 
do other than on call, did we do anything for them, you know, snow events, anything special that incentivizes them to be at work and mm -hmm. be on time and be here? Yes, we do have um, some policies around, especially snow and weather events, where they can get some time off if they work the event. Um, we also consider on an annual basis whether a bonus program is appropriate to help incentivize and reward them, depending on the weather conditions. So if we have extraordinary weather and um, the need to have more staffing, we will look at bonus programs. Those are available and authorized by the city manager. Okay. And then, you know, um, I don't necessarily disagree with what Mr. Marriott's saying around the FTEs. There's some validity to what he's saying. But I also believe, being a public servant myself now, that I've learned that um, sometimes the, the bench on these positions are single-threaded, and that causes some fear if that one person, especially in the hot job market, jumps. Uh, it puts a void, and then we drop services. Um, so I think there's some importance. I also believe that some of the jo uh, jobs that were presented were um, maybe evolved a little bit because the demand of our citizens and we're trying mm -hmm. to fill those needs while maintaining our current service levels. So I mean, I appreciate that, but I mean, there is some, you know, there's always been some concern about being remote and how effective are they and, and so forth. And I understand we do a lot of good reporting and KPIs with that. And so you know, as long as the productivity stays up, because we just don't want to put people in place that, you know, maybe the productivity is only 80% or 70%, uh, you know, um, because as much as we're giving, we, we need them to mm -hmm. be here to do our services. And we're just in a weird place, and we got to feel our way through it. So, Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I know it's interesting to be remote, but I've also learned in my day job, the problem I have now is everyone wants back in, and mm -hmm. I have no room for them. So interesting um, it, the problems we deal with. Yeah, it's it's different, right? It's people yeah. want to be back at work, and it's like they said they wanted to be remote. They say it right now, but the minute like they came in on Wednesdays, everyone comes in on Wednesdays, and they saw the food truck and they saw the interaction and the water cooler talk and getting things done and not mm -hmm. waiting for a phone call back or an email back because you can walk down to your office and talk to you. Then they're like, oh, I'm more productive. Yes. I need to be back in the office. So, it, you know, I don't know if there's something to encourage uh, individuals to come back, like Food Trek Wednesdays, mm -hmm. or something like that makes it fun, uh, or something we can do here. Um, but I do think that there is a, a mental health perspective to this discussion mm -hmm. uh, to get employees around uh, folks here in the office as well as the public. So, but no. I understand why they're there, so I support them. Thank you. Noted. I will make sure we, we include that as our as we continue to work in evolving this remote work, hybrid work. I don't believe we have anyone 100% remote. People are still coming and connecting, celebrating together, training, um, but definitely this is evolving. Um, we are definitely getting consistent message that the incoming workforce values this, so it's something we have to consider in our long-term plans. But if I may, I wanted to mention um, turnover, back to turnover. The top three reasons that employees tell us they're leaving. Two are things we can't really fix or fix. You mean city council? <laughs> <laughs> it's not you. <laughs> um, the first two are they're leaving Colorado. Um, cost of living and housing might, mm. you know, how we address housing might help, but it's not an answer we can mm -hmm. create tomorrow, right? Um, the second one is they're leaving public service, and this is especially true of our officers. Um, with all the things going on, all the challenges they're facing, but also other, other areas where they're being um, scrutinized and being dealt with by the customer, the, you know, the way that they're being handled. They are, they are leaving public service. Um, but the third one is workload. And so I think a lot of what you're seeing in these FTEs is addressing capacity issues and workload issues that we've been overworked for a decade or more. So just wanted to make sure that was... That and, was and I agree with the workload. I mean, knowing. I mean, we ask 150% of individuals, like, seven days a week almost. Mm -hmm. And so I get it. I think the struggle that may help, and I think the struggle I have, is how do you fold in our culture and our way within the city? Because it is, you know, it's sincere when we're at Devin's retirement party that... You know, there's a culture here that is actually top notch. Mm -hmm. And um, when you have somebody that's 90% remote, 
how do you fold in culture into that person of, you know, we dream big and deliver and all of these value systems when they're, they're only here one day a week or once every other week or however that works. It just seems like a challenge that we need to figure out how to overcome is the cultural. Because I, th I think it's, it's not just always, I hate to say it, but it's not always pay on every individual. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's the environment in which they work and being challenged and innovative and, yes. and engaging and, and culture. Absolutely, and again, we will continue to study and think of, you know, brainstorm ways that we continue to keep our culture alive in the cyber environment. Again, I don't think we have many workers who are on those types of schedules you mentioned. Um, it's really more like two and three, three and two. Um, so we do have weekly connection um, and measures to, in place to track performance, but but it is evolving and it will continue to evolve. Are those days when they're here, are they set days so that you have the majority of the staff here? It depends on the department. We, we allow directors to set what makes sense for their business, but I do see a lot of people here on Wednesdays and a lot of people here on Tuesdays too. Okay, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Lori, did you want to say anything? Yeah, I was just going to acknowledge the involvement of some really excellent staff, the number of positions being added. It, it got our attention as well too, and there were several that we didn't fund and positions that weren't added, but when we're addressing safety, our investments in infrastructure, our um, public safety staff, our culture of safety, um, there was a high need for additional positions. We had been running thin for a long time, and if you go to pages um, 12 and 13 of the, or 13 and 14 of the budget letter, all those positions are spelled out and the ask behind why they were added. So I'm confident they are justified, but when they are justified, we are also looking at productivity and culture. So we're watching both of those areas closely. Thank you, Lori. All right, so I do wanna give you a little bit of the other side of not just pay and just talk a little bit about some of our other reward elements. Um, some wins we've experienced this year of 0% um, premium increases to our health care and coincidentally our dental and vision as well. But the, the really big celebration is health care because that's four years in a row now that we will be at a flat premium increase, which um, is an incredible amount of savings given the medical trend has been about 7% per year. Um, we are also at the same time that we're safe keeping our premiums flat, we're also able to enhance our programs. So our employees will enjoy better vision benefits next year. And uh, we're working with a company called Regenix, uh, which is a alternative, non-surgical alternative to joint replacements. So you can rebuild your own cells and regenerate and not have to have surgery and have um, stuff added to your joints, and uh, we think this is a really interesting, it's also a cost saver if you don't have to have surgery, it's better for your body, it's a better alternative, so we are really excited and hope to be able to engage with them next year. And then um, I mentioned career progression. These are very um, attractive to uh, employees coming in from entry level when they see that they can advance and grow with the city, and this is exactly what these are developed for, is to bring in high potential employees, upskill them, grow them with the city, and that their contributions grow over time, as, as does their performance and their professional development. So these are highly successful and um, working really well. And then we're really, um, really good at gender pay equity as well. We're doing really good there. I would hope so. <laughs> I'm sorry, Things, can, you, uh, can you just clarify what that means by really good? Or, I mean, are we, are we even? Are we, <laughs> um, we are around 3%. So, and that's at any, so because our pay changes at any given moment, employees get their pay increases at different times. So it's hard to do like a one-in-time mm -hmm. comparison. 3% is our average step increase. Um, but right now, the raw wage gap without any accounting for um, what kind of job it is or how long you've been here or what your qualifications are is 3%, which means it's pretty small compared to the gaps the, the Gender Pay Act is trying to reduce of you know 30%. So um, we will run it again in January and report to you those results. 
And uh, it's looking really good though. Most of our job families were doing really well. Things we are working on is um, solutions for paid family and medical leave, which I'll talk more about in the family update. And then uh, we continue to work towards uh, improving our safe and inclusive work environment and updating our total rewards philosophy. So where we are with that, I know you've heard me bring that up a couple times. Um, it is a, a city council strategic result. We do have a plan to bring to you by the end of the year, the end of 2023, a brand new improved, new and improved uh, philosophy to help us continue to attract and motivate and retain our high performing workforce. We have um, some milestones we've completed so far. We have done a comprehensive rewards survey and that is, um, we surveyed our employees to understand what they value, what's working for them, what they'd like to see us research in the future or introduce in the future. And then we did a very comprehensive market benchmarking survey in which we compared ourselves and all those elements of rewards uh, from healthcare to housing. We compared ourselves against our most competitive cities and sort of benchmarked where we're at. It's harder to do that with the private sector. They don't share information like that as publicly. So we do have some benchmarking, but it's not as robust. Um, we had a leadership discussion in which we reviewed all of these results and began um, our initial drafting of our new strategy and philosophy. And we do have a draft completed, which we will uh, come to you soon. We're in the process of scheduling a date and time when we'll come to you with that information and discuss and hear your feedback on what you'd like us to pursue further. All right, that ends the pay plan update. If there aren't any questions, I'll go on. I don't see any additional questions, so let's move on to the family update. All right. Okay, so. As a reminder, I just want to give you a reminder of the benefits and the program elements of the family program. It is a state program. It was voted into law in 2020. It is a state-run social insurance program. Its intention is to provide paid leave to all Colorado workers who, and, and give them job protection when they need to leave their jobs for certain life circumstances. So you can see the, the available um, circumstances there, the eligible ones. The leave is for 12 weeks. Unless you have complications of childbirth, then you get an additional four weeks. So the idea is that um, workers who don't have this now are going to have this because it's uh, mandated by, by the act. Um, job protection starts at 180 days. <laughs> Paid leave benefits depend on income and is capped at a weekly cap of $1,100. So depending on what your income is, your, your income replacement will vary. The state estimates 37 to 90% of employee income will be covered, depending on what you earn. And the, in, these benefits are funded through payroll premiums of 0.9% of gross payroll, paid half by the employer and half by employees. Ms. Simpson? Uh, thank you. Is there a uh, gap? I know with some short-term disability policies, you have to wait, you know, five business days, ten business days, et cetera. Does this kick in the second you take leave, or is there a gap waiting period of a week or so? That's not clear yet. Those are some of the details we're still waiting to, to receive. Um, we don't, the benefits themselves won't start until 2024, so those guidelines are still being uh, developed. So. Stay tuned because I don't have the answer just yet, but we're, we're keeping an eye on it. No worries. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Gabriella, the tax part of this starts in 2023, correct? Starts yes. a year ahead. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so that's um, what it says here on my next slide is the premiums will start being collected this January. And that is to fund the program ahead of time before um, benefits start being paid in 2024. So what's unique about this um, program is Colorado local governments have been given options to participate. They've, there are three options which are listed here. Uh, the first one is the default. If we don't do anything, we will participate and um, we will start to submit our premiums to the state via payroll deduction in January. 
uh, we can opt to decline participation as an employer, but allow employees to opt in and let them remit their payment through payroll deduction. Or the last option is to decline all participation, which means we opt out as an employer completely, but employees can still choose to opt in and they pay their premium directly to the state. And um, if we do want to opt out, we have notice requirements. Um, declining participation requires a vote of the city council and a written notice to the state by the end of the year. And then we also must give our employees notice of the intent to vote and give them an opportunity to provide comment. So with the um, intention of having you vote on this next week, we did give all of our team members a written and electronic notice of this back in August and an opportunity to submit feedback. They were given a Google form they could complete or they can actually come to the meeting next week and provide comment. Uh, to date, we have not received any questions or feedback, so I have nothing to report there. But. I'm not expecting council chambers to be stacked next week with employees on this issue. Right. Okay. So the Arvada team, we are recommending that council decline all participation in family, and there are some reasons posted here. First one, I mentioned to Council Member Simpson, we don't know all the rules yet. They're still being defined. We still don't know how this will coordinate with other required leaves, uh, federal and state law, but also our own internal policies. We do understand there are some restrictions around how we can use our own paid leave programs when employees take family leave. So we wanna understand those better and wait to see how these things develop. Um, we can always choose to participate later if we decide this makes sense. And employees can still choose to participate on their own. So we're not taking that choice away from them. But most importantly, I think is, I think we can do it better if we put our minds together and create our own internal leave programs. We can provide similar or greater benefits to our teams for less cost and less administrative challenges. You think we can be more efficient than the state? I'm shocked. Mr. Marriott? Yeah, Gabrielle, I have a question on, on that point. <clears throat> is what we're looking at, is it, um, for lack of a better term, reinsuring ourselves on that? Or are we looking at taking the risk and, and just administering an, an equivalent program ourselves with our own dollars? Do you have any kind of head start on what that might look like? I do. Let me switch sides here. Okay. Sorry. I, no problem. I'll quit asking <laughs> questions before. Um, so we're still in the beginning stages of this research, but we do have some options we're considering. One of them is to look at our current existing policies and enhance them, redefine them. Uh, we do provide quite a bit of leave already to most of our regular employees. We have some gaps with our seasonal and variable hour teams, but we have very uh, robust sick leave policies now and we just need to tweak them a little and reassess them to make sure we're giving at least the same similar benefit. Um, so that is one thing we're looking at. Um, another alternative is to actually create a paid family leave program altogether separate and um, that offers the same exact benefits or better as the family program and that would be separate from our current leave policies but we wouldn't do that in a vacuum we would look at everything and make sure everything's appropriate and then a third option might be to actually purchase or implement a short-term disability insurance program which would come with some fees and some costs but the first two we are internally taking it in and the third one we're paying a third party and they're taking that risk, but then charging us back. So. Ms. Simpson? Uh, uh, real quick, with um, options two and three, which are decline employer participation and decline all participation, the employees are, who choose to participate, if anyone chooses to participate, are still remitting only 0.45% uh, of their salaries. They're not required to do the whole 0.9%. Correct. I'd be interested to see how the state pays for that. Me too. Ms. Smith. So when you're talking about this slide with the options, you're saying that the Arvada team could create a program that is similar or greater benefits that include all three, or it has to be one of the three. 
Yes, my intention would be that one of these would be the solution, or we could have a combination of the two. So we would want to look at the whole picture and make sure we come up with something that fits right for Arvada. And the state option has all three already that are listed here. They have the paid family leave. They have, they have leave policies. So the state has the number two. Just uh, number two? Yeah. OK. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I just make a comment? You may. Um, so I, would, I, I think that the alternatives that you're considering for the city of Arvada are exactly what you should be doing. Um, private sector does this every single day. Um, and you can, you can create a long-term disability program and fund it just like you're funding uh, your, health, your health benefits and you'll probably find that you'll run, that'll run you know, very inexpensively uh, as an employee paid benefit. You could also do a short-term disability program even through a third party uh, administrator and it would be probably much less expensive than um, what the state's going to offer plus you're not going to have the ambiguity, the ambiguity around um, what's available, what's not available, how does it get paid. Uh, I, I think the state's meddling in stuff that they need to stop meddling in and let private industry take it and let municipalities take care of their employees as they should. So that's just my thoughts. Thank, thank you, Council Member Jones. <clears throat> okay. I did some research, um, the cost around this. So if we did participate in family, our finance team estimates gross nine point, our share of the gross payroll for the first year would be around 330,000. And that would continue annually and it possibly would increase, most likely will increase. Um, employees cost will depend on their income. So the table there, I actually went on the state's salary calculator benefits calculator and I calculated out what would be the cost to employees making 50,000, 75 or 100,000 and you can see there the annual cost to the employee and the amount of their income that would be available or covered if they took leave. Um, on the right side is our alternative benefits. We do expect them to cost less. We, we priced out a estimate for the short-term disability plan that would be provided by a third party and they brought back an estimate of about $200,000 to administer and provide um, similar benefits to our team members that need it on an annual basis. And uh, we don't have at this point any associated costs that we would pass on to the employees. So at this point in time, we're not planning to charge employees for these benefits. We're not sure if the, the short-term disability pro program would be a shared cost or not. Mr. Fiverr. So if I was to translate the slide, it tells me the city would pay 330,000, then the employees would pay. So we're looking probably over north of $600,000 yes. total to the state between the city and the employee. Or the city can just go to a third party for 200,000 and the employees pay nothing. So it's like a third of the cost if we just did it ourselves, which a lot of employers do provide short-term disability as part of the benefits with no charge to the employee. Yes. Although we don't have a formal plan right now, we do have a very robust sick leave plan that covers a majority of our employees for the short-term period, and they don't pay for that right now. So. If we enhanced that program and did our, like one of the other options, it would be even less. Um, although we would still have soft costs, like the cost of replacing an employee if we need to continue productivity, things like that, that we would have to account for. So it'd be $130,000 cheaper for us approximately, okay. and no yeah. cost to our employees if we just kept it in-house. Yes. Okay. Ms. Simpson? Uh, thank you. So um, I love the no cost to the employees. That's great. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to keep that. I understand a small cost sharing for short term disability. Uh, to Mr. Fiber's point, I think one of the ways the private sector does it is um, pregnancy and childbirth is not covered under short term disability. And so usually women have to take un uncompensated leave. And so uh, this plan incorporates that. And I, we are looking at that yes. for 12 weeks to 16 weeks, correct? Yes. 
Okay, perfect. And then my only other sort of thought, it's not really a question, it's more of a comment. Um, with the state plan, they cap it at $1,100 per week. So while that won't impact most of our staff, those at the higher end of the salary spectrum, our engineers, our lawyers, et cetera, they'll be hit further, which I could see causing a talent deficit. Because if you're a woman of childbearing age who is interested uh, in having a family or expanding her family, and you can't cover all your expenses if you're the breadwinner, um, I could see how that could be a potential detriment um, to attracting um, top talent. So just a thought on that. And then um, I understand if we don't have an answer to this, but to that latter point, would we be looking at like a scale, like a 90% match, whatever your salary is, or would we also be looking at doing a salary cap on uh, benefits paid? I think we'll look at all options and come to you with, you know, the results of that. Um, and we want, you know, my next slide's gonna talk a little bit more about our culture and things like that, which will kind of give you a better feel for what I think we, the direction we'll take, but um, we'll do a lot of analysis first and do the, you know, we wanna do the right thing for everyone. Perfect, so. thank you. Mm -hmm. So my last slide, my final thoughts, I'm almost done. <laughs> um, it is a well-intended program. So I do wanna point out there are a lot of, and, and some of you have said this too, there are a lot of workers in Colorado who do not have paid leave options and are left unpaid when they, need a, when they have a serious life circumstance or when they wanna start a family. And so um, this is a well-intended program to help fill in that gap. Um, but I also want to point out that Arvada does provide our employees with paid sick leave and other paid options. And we have a people first philosophy which ensures that we take care of our team members when, they're, when they have needs. We do a lot of things to keep them covered under our insurance, keep them in a paid status, work with them. We have extended leave programs, we have a sick leave bank. We have a lot of things available to them. So we are not one of those employers that has a gap the way the plan is intended to fill. Um, and again, I do believe that we can enhance those programs to cover any gaps we do have and have similar or greater benefits by the time family goes into effect. And last points there really have more to do with, um, uh, you know, if we choose to participate, this is a mandate, essentially. Our employees have no choice. But if we choose to not participate, it becomes their choice whether they want to participate or not. So I think that's something that's really important. Uh, employees um, really value choice. So those are my final thoughts. I'll take any more questions. But I, Mr. I do. Mr. Mary, yeah. yeah, so just, just a comment. Um, I give you huge credit for navigating through this up to this point this whole state family program is an absolute mess um, for us as a small employer the net effect is the employees that I currently provide um, paid sick leave for will lose their paid sick leave and instead have only this family and and the uh, employees that I wasn't providing paid sick leave for will gain this family but my biggest prop my biggest concern with this family program is most predictions have it underfunded by about half and so um, you know, we might be doing this at a third. We might actually be doing this at a sixth of the cost of the real cost of this family program three or four years from now once it gets rolling. So um, thank you for spending all the time and work on this. I think this is a far better outcome for our city team. Um, certainly, I think it's a far better outcome for the taxpayers of, of, of the city. And um, I wish the public sector were provided the same options. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. You mean the private sector was up. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gillis? Did now we answer? Go ahead, Mr. Fiverr. Yeah, did we add, answer, are you good with the direction? I guess we'll know next you'll, week, right? You'll decide next, next week. week. Okay, mm -hmm. just want to make sure I'm both, right? <laughs> Thank you. Now Ms. we'll Gillis. have. Um, we'll have Carrie Espinosa, the Manager of Housing Preservation and Resources, provide an update on housing. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council. It's good to be here with you tonight. Well, there goes your credibility. 
<laughs> it's been a while since I've been up here. Um, so the purpose of tonight's presentation is to provide you with an update on what we've been doing in housing, um, review our current programs, what we're currently working on, um, and future projects that we're also working on. And this is our agenda for tonight. Um, we'll start off with a review of our current programs. Um, we'll talk about our transition from vibrant community and neighborhoods to, over to community and economic development, uh, followed by um, our uh, DOLA grant award that we recently received, our participation in the Housing Solutions Workshop, and the status of the Economic Development Survey, and then we will end with a review um, or an update on the status of the housing development um, specialist position, the housing advisory committee, and the affordable housing strategic plan. So the housing division's activities really fall into three different programs or categories. There's the Arvada Housing Authority, there is uh, the Community Development Block Grant, and the Homeless Navigation Program. With the Arvada Housing Authority, uh, we offer the Housing Choice Voucher Program, and with this program, the Housing Authority provides rental subsidies in the form of a housing voucher to approximately 500 extremely low-income households, so people around 30% area median income. We receive about six million annually from HUD for rents, and we are pleased to report that within the last two months, we received an additional 15 vouchers from HUD, which doesn't happen uh, very often. So we're really excited for those new vouchers and those will help us assist a few more um, low income households that are on our wait list. Within the last two years, the Housing Authority, we have exercised our ability to project-based vouchers, which is something that we've never done in the past. Um, and the reason we did that is we wanted to afford more affordable housing development. Uh, by project basing the voucher, that means that the voucher is then tied to the housing unit and not to the family. Um, but this is something that is a benefit up to the developers because what they can do is when that uh, voucher is tied to the unit, they can charge um, market rate rent for that unit rather than offering it at a lower cost because the housing authority is there to help subsidize that increased amount. So developers have been asking for us to project-based vouchers and that's something that we have listened to and we have jumped in to help fill that need. So far we've used project-based vouchers as a tool to support two housing development projects in Arvada, one being the Vance Street Flats project um, and Ralston Garden Apartments. And we are also, um, we offered vouchers to the Cornerstone Legacy Senior Apartments project as well. Um, and that is currently under review for tax credits. So we'll find out in early November if they are awarded. Um, and then the Housing Authority continues um, to partner with developers uh, to be a special limited partner in projects. We found this um, to be of huge benefit to the developers. Um, and the reason that they want us to be a special limited partner is for the property and sales tax exemption. Um, moving on to co the community development block grant, uh, the city receives an annual award of CDBG funding every year from HUD and that is approximately $450,000. We use that, those funding to support the Essential Home Repairs Program and that is a program that provides home repairs to low to moderate income homeowners. Um, we also use about 75,000 of our annual award to support the Human Services Grant Program. And then finally, we have the Homeless Navigation Program. This program is part of a larger regional effort to address homelessness. Um, it's a partnership with other cities and with Jeffco Human Services. And through this program, our housing and homeless navigators we, uh, they connect people who are experiencing homelessness with housing resources. Over the past 14 months, our navigators have housed 45 individuals, so we're really proud of, of the work that they've accomplished. Um, moving on to our transition from VCN to CED. In August, this transition happened 
Um, and the, one of the reasons for the transition is we were taking a look at the city council strategic results and, um, and determining what internal collaboration needed to happen in order to uh, support that work. And while we were doing that review, it was um, determined that there was going to be um, a lot of internal collaboration with the planning, um, the building divisions within the city. So it made sense um, to tr make that transition in order to enhance the internal communication between those divisions. Um, so we are certainly very happy to be part of community and economic development. And Ryan fought hard to get you, right? <laughs> I don't know, Ryan. You're on the <laughs> spot now. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> right answer. He has a war wound from that. <laughs> the DOLA planning grant. So House Bill 21271 uh, provided assistance to local governments to promote to promote the development and adoption of affordable housing strategies. The city applied for, and we were awarded 100,000 from the Colorado Department of Local Affairs to further our work, um, to uh, further our work related to affordable housing strategies. And our plan with this grant is to hire a consultant who will work with the Housing Advisory Committee to complete a City of Arvada affordable housing strategic plan. Right now we are in the process of working with purchasing on drafting an RFP to um, select a consultant, and we are looking at bringing that consultant on board in late 2022 or early 2023. Separate from the DOLA planning grant, the city applied for and was selected to participate in the Housing Solutions Workshop. Arvada was one of five cities selected nationally to participate in the workshop, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, and this workshop is an opportunity through Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, and the purpose of the workshop is for cities to receive technical assistance on how to develop a balanced and comprehensive housing strategy. Uh, we wanted to pursue this opportunity because we felt that it was an ideal time for the city team to come together to understand and share our vision for the affordable housing strategic plan. We, wanted, we want to be able to support the consultant to the best of our ability, as well as the housing advisory committee, which means we need to have a solid understanding of the key components in a housing plan. So we wanted to take on uh, this opportunity to receive that expert guidance. And so um, we also, felt it was a good opportunity for the city team to learn from our peer cities of what their housing challenges are um, and also their best practices to see if that's something that we want to consider. Mr. Fiverr? Yeah, so who's, who's participating in this from the city? Is it just your organization or is it the broader uh, development? Oh, uh, I think, oh, Linda, you raised your hand. So did you. We're doing hands now? Oh, the five, of, the five of you, okay. Plus Rob Smetana. Oh, plus you, okay. Oh, and you too, mm -hmm. okay. The five of us. Can, me too? No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. Uh, all right, I just was curious because if you're learning from this, I mean, how does it get like the golden threads down further into the organization? I'm mm -hmm. assuming you'll take it back and. Mm -hmm. the, the six participants are Council Member Marriott, Council Member um, Smith, Carrie, myself, Rob Smetana, our planning manager, and, and then, um, Deputy City Manager Haley, um, and that we will use that information to then um, work with our housing um, development specialist um, and then the housing advisory committee that comes on board and um, the consultant that comes on board to, to bring all this information. And there will be deliverables from this workshop to be able to share and educate the broader community. Yeah, will it will it pepper into like your uh, city planner side and that kind of stuff? Your plan, or is it solely housing? No, no, no. I mean, that, those are the reasons why we wanted to have a, a CMO perspective. We wanted to have a planning perspective, which is why what Rob's involved. We wanted to have a city council perspective, from which is from from the policy perspective. So all those things are included. Okay. All right, well, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's a great question because we all have a different, we're all coming at it from a different perspective, but we've never have come to the same table to really have that conversation. So this, I feel like this workshop is going to be a huge benefit to us in, a lo in the long run just to make sure that we all are following the same path. Yeah. Carrie, let me interrupt you real quick. 
the other communities that are participating, we have by far the most diverse group of participants in the, in the workshop, by far. Almost all the other communities, it's their housing authority staff members is their, is the majority or almost their whole, uh, whole, whole team. So we're, yeah. we're, we're a little different. That's great. I mean, coming from the, the, the diversity down, I, I think it's more of how does it get all the way to the roots and, and I appreciate that. That's good. Mm -hmm. good well, stuff. the diversity between our two city council members is probably about as diverse <laughs> as you can get. Uh, and I really want to thank both of you for offering to participate. It, it is, um, a time commitment to participate. Um, we are meeting twice a week for three weeks. It's two hours at a time. There's homework associated with it. So it is a big time commitment. So I, I really do appreciate the two of you being part of it. And we are the only city that has council members participating. So that's, that's pretty special too. Um, the next slide is talking about the economic development survey. Um, in the city of Arvada, we launched our 2022 residential economic survey. And before I go further, I just want to acknowledge there is an error on the slide. The first bullet point says that it was sent to local businesses and it was not sent to businesses, it was sent to residents. So I apologize for that. Um, but the residential economic survey went out to residents, giving them an opportunity to comment on how well we were meeting their needs in terms of growth and development. Uh, this year's economic survey included questions related to affordable housing. Um, for example, asking residents for their thoughts on workforce housing and if the, the lack, of re, lack of workforce housing might relate to staffing shortages, et cetera. Um, and so we wanted to get a sense of the city's community's perspective and perspective or preferences for affordable housing. Uh, the survey, it concluded the end of September and those results will also assist with our strategic plan efforts. The housing team is currently in the process of hiring a housing development specialist. This is a new position for the city and this position will serve as the staff liaison to the housing advisory committee and will also work closely with the consultant on the affordable housing strategic plan. The job description for this position is finalized and the position will hopefully post later this month. We are looking for someone with a background in affordable housing development that includes an understanding of funding resources and affordable housing strategies just so they can keep pace with the work that the advisory committee is going to perform. Onboarding for this position will begin in late November and early December. Mr. Marion. Carrie, I have a question about this particular one. So what else will this person do? Because that description's far from a full-time job, but I'm assuming we're hiring an FTE here, a full-time position. So what else will they do? Sure, so um, there are, for example, we have our private activity bonds that we um, allocate to various developments. I see them helping take on some of the tasks that I've been doing related to development, uh, working directly with those developers. Um, I certainly see the, um, once the work with the consultant is underway, I certainly see that being a big lift. And I'll go into this in some more slides, but with the DOLA planning grant, we are required to complete our um, affordable housing strategy by May of 2024. This, the advisory committee will be seated in May of 2023, which gives us 12 months to complete that strategy. And I think with um, the work that's going to be involved with that strategy, I, I see that this person being extremely busy um, with that plan. Okay. And then once the plan is completed, I think the future work of this position will be determined based on that, and uh, we'll have to take another look uh, at how busy that position is at that time, but I think that the strategy will provide some insight to that. So it might be a temporary position 
if, if in the end, if after all that's done, there's no need or not enough need for that to be a full-time position, it could be, could be temporary or could be, could be eliminated at, at the end. It could be. I just don't foresee that at this point. Um, uh, right now, with the direction that we're going and how busy we are right now, I see this position being able to help in various roles. Councilmember okay. Merritt, Thanks. if I could, if I could jump in here too. This is a new area where we haven't staffed or supported these efforts before. If you, we can get you the job description. It is broader. There is a lot of work there, but we're also going to learn and depend on what that. Um, what comes out of that housing advisory committee and how much time we'll be, we will be investing in these new projects and supporting ensuring that they happen and go yeah. forward. Yeah, well, if you have a resource available, you can figure out how to use it, I'm sure, so that's good. I would just like to add, I, I've heard over the past year, Mark talking about you and your team and how much you've been working and how much you've been strapped. And when we were discussing the housing committee, even just as a concept, it was a lot of pushback because of how overtapped you and your team are. So I appreciate seeing that this is being brought on in addition to the community um, committee. I just think that there's a growing need and it's being identified very often in the community. So I think we have a lot of work to do here. So I'm glad to see that we have some support. Yeah, I am certainly glad to see the support there. Um, the developers that approach us for uh, support for their projects is, uh, I've never seen it um, to the degree that it is. And it's a lot of administrative work that I could really use some assistance with. So I'm excited for this position. And I think it will also bring um, a skill set that we don't currently have here, which will be of huge value. Um, moving on to the Housing Advisory Committee. Um, in May of 2022, Council advised the city team to create a new city committee, which is the Housing Advisory Committee. This committee is tasked with making recommendations to City Council on matters related to affordable housing. We have drafted the bylaws for this committee, which will be sent to City Council for review after tonight's meeting. And the bylaws will be recommended for approval at the November 7th City Council meeting. A committee appointment will be the same as other committees, but due to some of the specific skill sets that are required for some of the members, we feel we might need to um, do some recruitment for some of the positions. An example is the affordable housing developer that is listed as one of the committee members. The number of affordable housing developers in Arvada may be very limited, um, we don't know, or they may not be aware of the opportunity to participate. So we're curious as far as how we're going to get the word out um, to, uh, the, to those individuals to let them know that we are looking for someone to fill these positions. So because we may need to look to recruit various members, we will be looking to for guidance from City Council on how we should proceed with that. The committee will be seated in May of 2023, and the Housing Development Specialist will serve as the staff liaison to that committee. And then the Affordable Housing Strategic Plan. The first task of the advisory committee is uh, to partner with the consultant to create an affordable housing strategic plan. The purpose of this plan is to outline the city's vision and goals for affordable housing development. The consultant uh, will facilitate the discussions with the advisory committee and the housing development specialist will be there to support the work. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are using the DOLA grant to pay for this consultant and per that agreement with DOLA, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, we must have the strategic plan completed and approved by City Council by May of 2024. Um, so this committee is going to be, they'll have one year to meet with the consultant and make recommendations for the strategic plan. Um, the consultant and the housing development specialist, in order to kind of jumpstart this work and make sure that the advisory committee is ready to go once they're seated in May. Um, the housing development specialist and the consultant 
can meet prior to that, sort of establish a roadmap, uh, um, establish a framework uh, to support the committee so it's ready to go once it's seated in May of 2023. I'll channel Lisa Smith here. To the extent we can move that along faster, we should try to do so. <laughs> right. <laughs> That is the end of my update. Are there any questions? Any questions, comments? Yay, Carrie. That's my only comment. Great job. Thank you. That's a good plan. Again, I, and I think, frankly, once we get the uh, committee in place, they're going to have some momentum and desire to move things along more quickly as well. I agree. So. I agree. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Ms. Gillis, do you have anything else for us tonight? No, just that next Monday is a big Monday with the budget. I'm um, coming for approval along with rates and mill levy certification, so. Very good. Thank you. We stand adjourned. <laughs>